Welcome to the September 28th uh, Mound Science and Energy Museum Association seminar. My name is Bob Bowman. I'm one of the directors, and I have the responsibility of coordinating our seminar program. And tonight we have a guest, uh, Terry Martin from Waynesville, who's been studying the history of the Manhattan Project and spies in World War II. And tonight we have the pleasure of hearing from Terry about the Dayton spy. It was really unknown for decades, but in the last few years it has become uh, much more well known. In fact, there was even a book written about him live to this was published last year, so uh, called The Sleeper Agent. But Terry's going to give his view of what he found out about uh, our uh, Dayton spy. And without any further ado, here's Terry. Thank you. I have a bad habit to start wandering around when I'm talking, so anybody in the back don't hear me, put your hand up real quick, and I'll get back to the mic. Uh, the Dayton Spy, as Bob said, is an American-born uh, Soviet or American-born spy that worked for the Soviets. We'll go into the detail. The information on this gentleman is still very limited. Uh, there was two gentlemen, one out of uh, George Washington University. Uh, another one out, I think it was Virginia, that wrote what you call thesis on that was where most of the information that I have came from. There was a lady that wrote a book, it's out right now, called Sleeper Agent, if you really want to get into the depth of it, and I did take things out of that. When you do research, as most of you might know, you do have some cross signals. One person will say one thing, another will say another. So when I do run across that in here, I will try to tell you so you can make up your mind. Well, we lost it right off. There we go. The only reason I showed you, I did a plug for University of Dayton. I taught this course at what they call a UD Dolly. That's for the over 50 group that uh, we meet at the NCR uh, building over there. And we have classes. So if anybody wants to, I can give you when we break or no finished it out, I'll give you more information on that. There's George Koval. That Zora up there is the Russian for George, uh, from what I could find. Born 1913, and 2006 is when he died, and we'll try to take you through his life here. The story of the atom bomb, or the atomic bomb, is really what this is all about. I'm not going to get into real big detail because you've got some scientists sitting around here who can really tell you about <laughs> the atomic bomb. But what was happening was the German scientists had figured out some things on fission at that time. And these are the three gentlemen that were working on it at that time. This was an English spy called Paul Roseberg. He found out about that and got the word back to England. And they, in turn, got the word back to many of the scientists that had fled out of Germany over the years because of Hitler. At the same time, I don't know if a lot of people know this, the Japanese were actually working on something that could have been the atomic bomb, and so was uh, Khrushchev, Khrushchev, if you can pronounce it right. But none of them really had gone that far. The war would take like the Japanese mind off that. They had other things to take care of and to do. So, I put these names on here. We're not going to go through each one of them, but each one of these scientists somewhere or another had something to do with either the fission or with the creating, we'll say, of the atomic bomb. Now the letter, and I think many of you might have heard about this. Uh, this Rosebud sent word back about the Germans. Now let's put one thing to rest here on the Germans. I did a three-week course, uh, I mean a three-semester course on uh, uh, Adolf Hitler. Yes, they worked on fission, but the Germans were nowhere close to ever having an atom bomb. Now, our movie people will put movies that two minutes from now the Germans are going to have the atomic bomb unless we get in here and do this and that. The story goes, supposedly, Albert Speer went to Hitler and told him they were making steps with like uranium and fission. 
he made the mistake of mentioning either Einstein or one of these other Jewish fellas' names. Hitler said, that's a Jewish thing, I want nothing to do with it, and walked away. Speer supposedly went back and told the scientists to keep working, but do not work on it for a weapon. Work on it for whatever would help us in arms or stuff like that, but not as a weapon. And that pretty much put the end to whether Germany was going to have the atomic bomb. I am sure if they didn't be fighting on two fronts and stuff, yes, probably Hitler could have ended up. And Speer does say in his, one of his books, he said Hitler would have had no problem dropping it. If he had the atomic bomb, it would have been dropped, that's for sure. Yeah. Anyway, they get Einstein to sign the letter and send it over to Roosevelt. They take it to this Alexander Sachs, who was a very close friend of Roosevelt's, and he takes the letter to Roosevelt. Let me, uh, before I get there real quick, the story goes, there's several stories on this, but the story goes, he reads the letter to Roosevelt. Roosevelt says, oh, okay, I'll look at it. Sachs says, I'm going to stay over a day, can we have breakfast tomorrow? And Roosevelt says, of course. The next day, Sachs starts in on Roosevelt again about what this letter means. Halfway through the letter, supposedly Roosevelt put his hand up and says, stop. What you're trying to tell me, if I don't do something here, we're going to go boom. Sachs says, that's right. So, they created the Manhattan District, but I got a little ahead on this. This is where the different offices, you see Dayton in there, Richland, that's where Hanford, uh, all the other ones, Oak Ridge, Los Alamos. They give this gentleman $6,000 to create an atom bomb, <laughs> something like that. Anyway, Mr. Briggs was going through a bad time in his life with health, so a lot of stuff was not getting done. The British come over here, they call it the Maud Committee, these three gentlemen come over here with the idea they're going to learn something from us. They find out we don't know as much as they do, so they go home. The other way this thing really kept going is Churchill and Roosevelt had a meeting in Canada, and this was brought up and Churchill impressed Roosevelt how serious this was. So when Roosevelt comes back, he puts James Continent in charge. James Continent had been the president of Harvard University. And he became what you call the Office of Scientific Research. Then Vandler Bush was the guy that was the chairman who was making everything happen. And he did make it happen. Of course, you've heard of this gentleman. He wanted Leslie Richard Groves. He was only a colonel. But when they put him in charge of the Manhattan District, their office was in Manhattan. That's where all this Manhattan will come from, the Manhattan Project or stuff. But the original office was right there in Manhattan. This gentleman had a reputation of getting things done and not taking no for an answer. They made him a brigadier general, gave him a promotion. First thing he says, I want Robert Oppenheimer. The Army says you can't have him. Why? He's a communist. Groves says, I don't care. And he said, well, wait a minute. Oppenheimer's wife's a communist. Oppenheimer's brother's a communist. Even turned out Oppenheimer's mistress was a communist. He said, I still want him. He was never what you call named a communist per se, but he was a very, very far left liberal, we'll put it that way. But anyway, Groves says, I'm taking no for an answer. It's Oppenheimer, in which they did name him. Of course, the, one of the first things Groves did was but get the land down there at Oak Ridge. They'll do the same, I'm going to show you a slide here in a minute of Hanford, but there was a couple farms or something down there, and they pretty much moved those people out. It never said whether they got compensated or what, but they got moved out. And that, they built Oak Ridge on 60,000 acres in 1942. The workers at Oak Ridge were most of them, are, quite a few of them were women. I don't want to say the most, but quite a few were women. Understand, and I think probably the man might have been the same way, these people did not know what each other was doing, and they were not to know. 
they had their own little compartments what they had to do and they were supposedly not to be talking to one another about what their job was and of course you can see loose talk loose lips sink ships i mean you all had all kind of different uh things this is getting ahead of everything but many of those people that worked there didn't know they were working on an atomic bomb or parts for the atomic bomb until they saw this newspaper when we did drop the bomb Many of them said, this is the first we knew about it. Of course, then you go to Los Alamos. Uh, Los Alamos was uh, probably the favorite of, of uh, what's his name there, he, uh, of Groves and stuff, because it was so he had done horseback riding and all that kind of stuff at Los Alamos. But what they did have to have, where they placed it, 54,000 acres, the closest town was like a two-hour drive, but they said, let's get it close to the mountains. At least the people that work here can have some sport. You go to the mountains, ski, and so on and so forth. They had to make it appetizing enough to get people to come in to work. Now, there's another picture of what they call the Atomic City, which they have a museum out there now uh, for all this. At the same time this was happening, Glenn T. Seaborg and his partner uh, discovered plutonium. I think it was at the University of California. And that had a play into all this as we go along. Now Hanford was a small town. They said there was like 35 people that lived there. And the one thing that I read, they gave them 15 days to move. Some got paid, some didn't. They had to get out. And they had 15 days. They claim there's over 400,000 acres. Of course, I think, I don't show it there, but uh, there is a big reactor. I think Warren had me take the reactor picture out. Uh, but there is one of the large reactors that uh, was there. Now we'll get to the George. I just wanted to give you a little bit of foundation how we got into the atom bomb or atomic bomb business, we'll say. George Cole is born in uh, Sioux City. Iowa on Christmas Day. Uh, it ends when he dies in Moscow in 2006. Uh, there's just a picture of it real quick. Again, uh, his parents were in Russia. The Tsar was very, very mean to the Jewish people. Almost like you would say what Hitler did later. Uh, many of the Jewish people fled from there. There was an organization here that invited them to come to the United States. They would come in through Galveston, Texas. Many of them settled in Sioux City. They built their synagogues, they had businesses, schools, churches, everything. And that's when his parents came in there in 1910. His father was, had a shop, but he was a carpenter by trade. Um, the mother, one thing that everybody is just hard to find this all the time, but the mother was a socialist even then. She didn't call herself a communist, but she was a socialist and believed in socialism. She didn't say anything about the father too much, but I'm sure he went along with it. They had three sons. The oldest one was born in 1912. Of course, George on Christmas Day in 13, and Gabriel 1919. Gabriel, when they all go back, you'll see in a little bit, Gabriel ended up fighting for the Russians and gets killed in the war, in World War II. He'll be the first to go. George goes at Castle on the Hill, Central High School in Sioux City. George graduates when he's 15 years old. So he goes to the University of Iowa from 1929 to 30, takes two and a half years of chemical engineering. Well, the Depression hits, and they decide to go back. Uh, there is an organization now in Russia, and they've had the revolution, and they're inviting many of the Jews back into Russia. And they decide they want to go back. Now, if I can... Right in here is where they get sent. They wanted to be way over in here, but Stalin said, no, no, you go where I tell you. And 
I went to the pronunciation of this six times and still can't get it right. Bellabozon, something like Bellabozon is what they called it. Anyway, this is where they were. You could call that Siberia. Uh, there's like China and some of that in through there. But they built this town up, the Jewish people. They had a library, there were synagogues. They did a pretty nice job until Stalin will eventually turn on the Jewish people himself. <clears throat> There's just another picture of where it is and down in the territory. And after, after being back there, he helped his father plant, plow, do carpentry work. He helped build it. George wants to go to school, and he goes to Menlo and studies chemistry. And he will graduate from here as a chemistry uh, student. There's the wife, uh, they always called her Myla, and he married her in 1936. Now you're going to see Lily when he comes over here and so on and so forth. She ends up working in a, she's a scientist herself, by, uh, that's where he met her at school. She'll end up working in a war plant over there in Russia, and it will affect her health. But she takes him when he comes back, after he's gone for six years. He joins the young communists. George did believe in that, and he believed it to the day he died. He believed in the system, uh, how he put it. And he joins the young communists. Well, the GRU, which is their main intelligent director over there, get wind of George and some other people at the university, high grades, and they invite him in. In the book it says something about he goes in, the guy just sitting at the desk looks at him for a minute, asked a couple questions, says, we'll get in touch. Which they did, but he didn't think anything was going to happen there. What they did, they put him in the army. So that way, if he was, anybody took notice why he was missing, he's in the army. He goes into the army as a private, but he's being trained by the GRU to be a spy. That, so we all ought to know that. The main reason that they trained him and was sending him back here was for poisonous gas. The Geneva Conference, I think, had said no poisonous gas. Every country, including the United States, was making poison gas as World War II came around. Russia was, all that. What they wanted to find out is how far ahead we were on the poison gas. And supposedly he had a two-year obligation, which will go much longer than that. In 1940, they call it going on a business trip. That was tr the terminology, you're going on a business trip. He comes in through San Francisco. His code name is Delmar. There's two stories on how he came in. He came in over on a tanker. One story says he has some false passports. Two of the other stories says he did not that all he did, when the captain, the captain's wife, and their little girl got off, he got off with them, and they all four just walked right on through. Now, he is still an American citizen, so, but supposedly he got in that way. He goes to New York. Now, this gentleman here is, I don't know if any of you heard about it, this gentleman is almost as interesting as George Colby. It's only this fella here, these two don't mean anything. This is Benjamin Lassoff. Somewhat the same story that Cole, but much earlier than that. He comes from the Ukraine. He comes over here. That Faraday will be his code name. We'll get into him a little bit more as we go along. He goes to Ohio Northern University. I contacted them, that's how I got that picture. They were really amazed about this and asked for the story, which I did send it up to them, and they supposedly put it in their graduation archives about him, uh, who he was and what he was. Uh, he came over here, and I got the question mark. Nobody knows what ever even happened to him. The last they know, he's in Paris, but we'll get into that. He came to America in 1906 and went to Ohio and Northern University, studied electrical engineering, and became a naturalized citizen. And he took the oath up in Kenton, Ohio, in 1911. He 
graduated June 6, 1912, and he enrolled in MIT. Russia was really big on spies going to college or being parts of like sorority groups. There's where the information would come. When you're in there, like this whole room, we sit around and talk. Somebody might say, well, yeah, he's driving the Jeep and he's doing this and that. Oh, he works over. That's the information that they were looking for. And that's why so many of them, I don't know if MIT likes to even talk about that, but supposedly several Soviet spies have come through MIT over the years. Uh, he married a girl from Russia who was studying to be a doctor. Her brother was already a doctor in Boston, and they used his address for their passports. He wanted to go back to Russia. She said no. She'll finally give in. He joined the Communist Party. That's the United States uh, Communist Party USA. He joined that. If you realize, of course, this is early, but the Communist Party got pretty big here for an actually third party all the way up through the Depression. Uh, a lot of people did uh, belong to it. He goes in 24, he goes back over to Moscow. He helps Moscow lay out their electric grid, him and other engineers, but he had something to do with that. He'll end up working for General Electric. There was a man running, I didn't put his name in here, but there was a man running General Electric that was a real, real far liberal socialist type. And these guys, he hired these different ones like this. For some reason, and they never ever came up with the reason, he changes his surname to Lassen, L-A-S-S-E-N, and he drops out of the Communist Party. And after the name chase, he moves to Warsaw. Supposedly the GRU got him there, took him and trained him, and then sent him back over here. He would be what you call the handler, not only of Cobalt, of many spies. Something you have to understand, we're talking about spies, the atomic bomb, military. At that time, Russia was sending spies almost to any industry. They had spies in the General Motors area, they had spies in GE. What they're trying to do is find out how they can bring their country into what we want to say the 20th century, is what we're saying. So there were more than just spies over here for uh, military purposes. Soon after, Lassen was recruited by the GRU, the Red Army. Uh, sometime in 34, 36, Lassen and his wife returned to the United States. Again, his name was Fair. He was fluent, uh, look at this here, he's fluent in Russian, English, French, German, Polish, and Ukrainian. Wow. Now, there, and this building still stands, he opened a business called Raven Electric Company. It was a front. Although they did, he had some government contracts to sell electrical wires and all that. Two real funny stories there a little bit is uh, one of the guys that worked there says, I never understood how we stayed in business. We sold below cost. Another guy went with him while he went to collect money. He says he went to six different New York banks. He had a book. The guy had to stay down and Lassen would go up on an elevator and come down with a wad of money. He asked him one time, he says, where are you getting all that money? Lassen said, I'm playing the stock market. So, whatever. Anyway, they said that he would meet up in here with his other, now, Coble, understand something here, I got it on a slide though. Spies do not know spies. You're a Russian spy, and he's a Russian spy. He's not to know you, and you're not to know him, and not to know that you're spies. Otherwise, that's how you get caught. <laughs> Put it that way. Okay, and by this time, Cobles worked his way to New York. Oh, I say worked, he's came to New York, and he rolls at Columbia University. Uh, he takes chemistry there. Now, don't, don't forget, he's already graduated over in Russia as a chemistry student. What his job was, was to get to know the professors, which he did, also get to know the head of the chemistry and the physics department. Um, there is nothing said in all the readings that I've done, which is not that much, but all the readings. Nobody disliked George Cole. He was an easy person to get along with. He loved baseball, because he played it when he was a kid. 
He loved baseball. He he was just one of the guys, quite frankly. What a good spy has to be, I guess, is what you would say. There's just a picture of Columbia University. Of course, we got a war going on now. And 1941, he has to register, because he's an American citizen, he has to register for the draft. Lassen is able to get him deferred twice. You were allowed to be deferred twice. The deferment was that he was important to Raven Electric's business. Nobody really knew what Raven, their business was, but he, Lassen. Now Lassen, I kind of go off base here a little bit. Lassen had senators, he knew people, he ingratiated himself with people and he knew things that were happening. He had a couple of people, one guy was the head of the war board that was very friendly with him. He was able to pick up information himself. Well, finally, he has no other choice. Uh, George has to be drafted. He has to go in the Army. And he goes to basic training at Fort Dix. <coughs> then you right away, I guess, if some of you have been in the service and all that, you take a test and they can pigeonhole you to where. And of course, he is very smart, and right away they put him into spaceless high grade technicians. I got 39 plus, there was 40 of them, 39 other fellows plus Coble. They sent him down to the Citadel for a very brief period of time for some more training, and then they bring him back up to CCNY in 1943. And there, uh, for eight months, he studies electrical engineering. The guys never thought too much of it at the time. They did say so later when they were interviewed. He was a decade older than the guys. He was about 10 years older than them. He never seemed to do homework. Of course, he'd already graduated. He was already a graduate. In fact, he still turns out to be the top student of all of them. There's a picture. There he is, right there. Uh, see with a smile and such. Okay, after completing the necessary coursework in 1944, Coleman and a dozen others from were selected for spatial engineering detachment, that's called SED, and a vital component of the Manhattan Project. Now, what I want to tell you before he goes to Oak Ridge though, let's go back to Lassen for a minute. Lassen's working out in New York. He's like the handler of all these different people. He also had a couple of men working for him that automatically went to most of the, like on the eastern seaboard, the large cities, just to gather information. They would read newspapers, they would talk to people, just to find out what's going on. One of them comes back from Knoxville. Tells Lassen, he says, I don't know what's going on down there, but about 20 miles outside, they're building something outside of Knoxville, and they're hiring people. Now, this is, this is being surmised even by the historians. Lassen somehow, and I got down here, they're sending uh, uh, Coble down to site X-10. Coble had no idea where he was going or what he was going for even, and I got a question mark that Lassen. Lassen must have known from his contacts in Washington, D.C. Either that or that's the luckiest thing in the world that they sent him down there. You got to remember there's 40 people. Some of them did go with him, but he was the main one that goes. He's infil infiltrated Oak Ridge. He had professionally trained intelligent officer into America's most secret endeavor. Now, I know some of you might want to ask about whether well, there were spies out at Los Alamos, most and all that. What the historians have called, this is a trained Russian spy. The spies that were in Los Alamos, yes, they did damage, they sent things back. They called them walk-on spies. Just like we follow Ohio State football, walk-on, <laughs> you didn't get a scholarship. What those people would become spies, more or less, or either for money, they might have believed in communism. There were other factors. They were not professionally trained. Not to say they didn't do a good job. Klaus Fuchs is the name I think everybody probably has heard. He was an Englishman and he does get caught, goes to jail and so on and so forth. Of course, the, uh, 
the Goldbergs, uh, we remember that story and everything else uh, for them. Anyway, George Cole is down there at Oak Ridge, and what he has seen, maybe for him for the first time, is plutonium and some polonium, the urchin, which is what we, I call it the trigger, so you can slap me down if you don't want that, but I call it, it's easy for me to figure the trigger. He has a new handler named Clyde. Nobody will ever figure out who that is. That's, whoever that was is long gone. Nobody even has an idea about that. Anyway, he sends some of this stuff back. Six months later, Kobo and Clyde get together in the existence of the secret nuclear city. By sending that back to the Soviets, their, their thing is that, my God, the Americans are serious about this. Now they want to know more, and as fast as they can. Producing uranium and plutonium and transported to Los Alamos. He's talking about, he sends back, they're able to send back the, the amounts of stuff to the scientists in the Soviet Union. I just put these pictures in. There's the X-10. Now there's other sites I'm going to show them to you. Most of the scientists were here at X-10. Not saying they didn't go out to the, the others, but Koval was became the health physics. He could go anywhere, everywhere, and all that. He had a private jeep, uh, and again, being friendly, became very friendly with a lot of the scientists there, and pretty much knew what was going on. There's a picture of the X-10 graphite reactor. The X-10 graphite reactor, formerly known as the Clinton Pile, there was a company called Clinton down by there, and they called it the Clinton Pile the world's second artificial nuclear reactor. Enrico Fermi's was the first at Chicago. One historian refers to Fermi as being the father of the atom bomb. I don't know if everybody buys that or believes that or not, but that is, they're saying, because he did uh, the one at Chicago, the first reactor. They were working on some of this at Columbia when uh, Colville was there. Now, it didn't say that Colville got to know everything, but there is a possibility he had an idea of what that was all about, even from being in Columbia. There's the K-25 at Oak Ridge, Site K. Uh, that was the code name given the Manhattan Project site. It produced enriched uranium for atomic bombs using gaseous diffusion. Site 12 at Oak Ridge, and that was the code name for the electromagnetic isotope separation plant for producing enriched uranium. I, why I have this on the slide is right away a man put it in my class, put my hand up and says, how many tons is Troy ounces? I had to go back and look to get him an answer. It's 13,540 short tons, whatever that is. But that was the answer to whatever that was. Wow. Picture why I showed this is one of this lady right here, I don't have her name, was interviewed about this after the bomb and all that. She said, I only knew what I was doing here. I didn't know any of the other, and I don't even know what I was doing here, but I had to write down numbers and give them to somebody. That was how it was all compartmentalized to the point that uh, nobody should know what the other person was doing. And that's how nobody really knew they were building or they are taking steps to build the, at a bomb. Yeah. For the audience here, those are mass spectrometers. Okay. Okay, electromagnetic. Okay. She's sitting right there in front of one of them. So. Okay, just real quick, there was two different bombs. Most of you probably know this. Uh, the first one was the uh, what you call the gun-type design called Little Boy. They also supposedly had the urchin in there also, but the gun-type thing. This bomb was never tested. But they had tested the components of it according to one scientist and said there was no way this bomb would fail. So, now this one was tested at Trinity, and I got another picture for you on that. And this is the implosion bomb that used the urchin and is what Dayton did during the atom bomb, and we'll get into that here in a few minutes. And you can see a little bit different looking on the bomb. Little boy exploded 1,500 feet above the city of Hiroshima with a force of 15,000 tons of TNT. 
it was important, it was like if we're talking about these triggers, it had to go off right there at that 1500 or 1600. If it went off too soon, it wouldn't have done any damage. If it went all the way to the ground, it wouldn't have done any, anything. It had to go off the way this is set up. The fat man exploded at 1800 feet over the city of Nagasaki. That bomb had an explosive force of 20,000 tons of TNT, so it was a bigger bomb. Now, some historians even say it's a little bigger than that. I'm going on war in here, <laughs> saying this is about what it should have been. Um, more people were killed in Hiroshima than they were in Nagasaki. And the reason being, I won't show it yet, the reason being uh, Nagasaki had hills, and they but due to the cloud part of it, they had to come off center a little bit to where they dropped it. It did damage, it killed a lot of people, but it didn't kill as many as the bomb in Hiroshima. Cole observes while monitoring radiation levels, scientists trying to separate minute quantities of mysterious element, polonium. The Russians know nothing about that until he sends that back. And then they want to know more. Clyde, the GR wanted Kobo to keep track of Oak Ridge polonium. This was due to the Soviet scientists. The Soviets, when we talk about it towards the end, the Soviets went with a plutonium bomb, not a uranium bomb. And the Soviets, when they built thirds, were about out of money, more or less, after the war. Money becomes an issue. Even in Germany, going way back to what I talked to you in the front, Part of the reason, and Hitler didn't say it's a Jewish thing and all that, they didn't have the money at that time in the war to put into something like this because they still got to just try to make the, the weapons for a day to day. On June 27, 1944, Delmar comes to Dayton. He gets transferred up here to Dayton, Ohio. He assumes the same job that he had at Oak Ridge, and that's a health and physics officer where he can go wherever. The difference here is no uniform, no jeep. He's on his own, they have to use trolleys and stuff like that because as you're going to see the locations, they're all, you know, in close. There's a dad just threw that in, that's a 1944 postcard of Dayton. 1943, the show on here, um, and I'll, I'll explain each and one of these as we go around here real quick. The warehouse, that's downtown, and that's it. The seminary, uh, there's a building maybe left out there, one or two, but there's most of all this is all gone. Uh, there are offices, the Thomas Hopewell offices. Um, and then there was something down in here had nothing to do with any of this. Of course, the playhouse was the big one also. We'll talk about that here in a second. Charles Allen Thomas is put ahead of this. His daughter wrote a book, I saw it down there in your uh, Polonium at the Playhouse. Yeah. Um, he was offered to go out and have Oppenheimer's job or to co-work with Oppenheimer. He turned that down and didn't want to leave here. He was originally from Kentucky. He worked for Kettering at one time and then him and this uh, other gentleman went out, Hawkwell, went out on their own. Monsanto comes to them and technically buys them out and they're working for Monsanto is what is what's happening here. But he's in charge of getting the polonium made. Now when I say made, he's to solve the problems of polonium purification and production in the required quantities. They would make the quantities, put it on special trucks to send back out to Los Alamos. When the mound opens, and I don't want to step on anything, <laughs> when the mound opens here, they actually will make the whole trigger, if I'm not mistaken. Right now, all they're doing is, I call it the ingredients, but they're making the, the product to make, and it goes to Los Alamos that they assemble what you would call the trigger. There's a uh, bone brick. That's what it looked like before they remodeled it. Uh, it was a seminary. And now some, like I said, I think one or two of these buildings are still standing out there. <coughs> the seminary's going. Uh, unit three, they call that, buildings four and six. And there's kind of just the layout of what all the buildings were out there, uh, on there on, the, on West First Street. And then the playhouse, so there's different pictures of the playhouse. Uh, 
the Talbots. Thomas was married to a Talbot, and the Talbots owned the playhouse. This house is tore down. There is another house. It's a little cul-de-sac that's up there. This is all kind of got trees and everything. There is a house down in here, uh, several houses that have crossed the line here. I would say they're probably about four hundred, five hundred thousand dollar homes in there, if not even higher. But they had the playhouse. They go to Oakwood, they go to the Talbots to get into this. Kind of gets long, but real quick, they they want to rent the playhouse, but they cannot tell them what they want it for. So Thomas tells them it's for developing uh, wartime films photography stuff. They make out a deal what how much the tablets will get paid, how much all this is going to be, and they promise to give it back as they got it. That won't happen. They ended up something like I read in one book when they cleaned it up, they had to go down as far as seven foot in the ground and remove soil seven foot deep for all the way around there because of the radiation and the cobblestones and everything. They will compensate the Talbots, they will get money for it, but uh, they don't get the playhouse back, let's put it that way. <coughs> There's just another couple of pictures of it. Downtown, which is interesting, GE owned this building and it was a warehouse for some of the equipment. They just redone this building and it's called the Manhattan Building, of all things. At some point in time on those two show here. Up in here, they tested radiation on animals. It's the only time that's brought up, but that's what they did do there. So, anyway, if you drive down there, of course the ballpark's right down the end of that street there. Uh, it's the play, uh, baseball park. The building really looks nice. I don't think anybody's in it yet. They're working in it, but I mean, it looks like it's finished. I don't know what else they're still doing. There's just another picture of it before. That was the old DP and L stuff there. There's what it looks like now. They built those steps. You can see in those windows. It looks real nice. And they give it the name. You would ask the workers. I ran into the workers just by chance the other day at a coffee shop. And they were getting, I heard them say the Manhattan Building. I said, you working there? Oh, yeah. I said, do you know why it's a Manhattan Building? They had no idea. And I had to real quick explain to them, well, and I went into a little more depth. Yeah, the atom bomb was made there. They, I what? <laughs> so, now I did straighten it out, though. Now, when Cobo comes, he first rents a, an apartment with John Bradley, and then him and John Bradley rent this house, which is still standing, 827 West Grand Avenue. I think some of you knew John Bradley or knew of John Bradley uh, working at the mound. Bradley had been down at Oak Ridge with Cobo, when they came here, the two of them also write something, uh, and maybe Warren can tell me more, they did write something on radiation and radiation protection. Science, and all that. Right. Yeah, Science. and it was well recognized in the industry. You can tell this is a monitor because so we've got a dish <laughs> up there in front. Uh, but anyway, on 827 Grand Avenue, and just to show you how, see where he's at in the, uh, Unit 3, from there to there, and that's why I said they, he never had a Jeep. I don't know if they had a car or somebody loaned them. But the one, one uh, book uh, kind of says that they, to get any of these places, they had to get on a streetcar and get there. Because everything is hush-hush. The fact of what Dayton did, and the, uh, what the city of Dayton and all this did, in the, in the atom bomb thing, supposedly was kept secret to 1982. Now, yes, you had the mound in 1949 and all that, but all these other goings on supposedly was under still restriction not to be told. Not saying probably some people knew, but they says that 1982 is when it was finally released. The health physics officer is again. I looked up and I asked Warden, I guess Warden will go along with this, this is the job of the health physics officer. Uh, construction and maintenance of instruments, electronic counting of surveys, monitor can contamination levels, and areas surrounding site facilities. 
One person really said that he would go out as far as 50 miles. I don't know about that. I only saw that once. And rather, if he didn't have transportation, I'm not so sure how he went out 50 miles. But he was able to, you know, work the Dayton area, of course. He would have access to laboratory buildings, Unit 1, 3, and 4. Probably he was more at the playhouse than he was anywhere, though, from what if you wait or you read all this, that he did more work there. Now Bradley was at the playhouse, but he was like a boss inside uh, the playhouse, I do believe, in the different ones he working in such. Clyde and the Urgent. Plenty of time, now by being this, and everything being so close where he could get around, he had uh, plenty of time for Coble to be away and time to discuss the Urchin with his handler Clyde. Coble Spine provided the Soviets with a better understanding of how each of the Manhattan uh, engineering district sites functioned and how polonium was obtained. One Russian writes over there that uh, the recipes that Coble sent back made the Russians able to build the atomic bomb. Now, I guess we could get in with scientists and uh, how true that really is, uh, but this was very vital what he sent back to them. But Soviets did know until Kobo came to Dayton that polonium had to be separated and purified, so they didn't know any of this before it could be used in laboratory experiments. They just had bypassed it before, and they didn't understand it. The work was carried out in Dayton in volume. And this is just one, one little thing. This was volume that they sent. They would send out to uh, Los Alamos, and now Los Alamos was telling them what they needed, and that's when Thomas would have to say, hey, we've got to work more. They, they said there was nothing more than probably every one of them worked six days a week. Maybe as high as like 12 hours a day and stuff like that. There was a lot of work being done. There's just a picture there of the Trinity when they dropped. This is the implosion bomb, nicknamed the Gadget. And this is uh, the one that they would drop on Nagasaki then. The two planes that did it, I just bring this in for your information, the Enola Gay. There was another pilot who was supposed to have a plane, and they bumped him and gave it to Shipley there on uh, uh, that. Oh, he raised all kind of hell. The second one is called the Boxcar. The guy, the pilot of that was named John Bach. The only problem was he got bumped the day that the plane went up, so his plane went, he stayed back. So another pilot actually flew the plane that day. When he was out there with the bomb on Nagasaki, this plane was up also doing weather uh, uh, reconnaissance. Now, just for your information, of course we've talked about it real quick, this is the first one. Kokura was to be the second one, okay? The cloud cover covered it. So they moved over to Nagasaki and it had clouds and they were about out of gas. They almost was going to come back when there was an opening, as I said, and then they dropped the one on Nagasaki. And many of you know, Kurt, know the name Curtis LeMay. Curtis LeMay at that time was firebombing, what they call firebombing, uh, Tokyo and all that. And he always said we didn't need to drop those bombs. He said, if you let me finish, I would have burnt Japan down. Now, maybe that's true, I don't know. but. He was sending out the firebomb, they had to come in and lower, you know, and they, they were vulnerable to being shot at. These planes, uh, the anti aircraft couldn't reach them, supposedly. February 12, 1946, it's all over. Coble was discharged from the Army at Camp Atterbury, Indiana. He received three military honors the Victoria Medal, the American Theater Ribbon, and the Good Conduct Medal. Now, he has a job offer from Thomas to go to work here at the mound. And he turns that down. And I'm going to tell you about the why the refusal. The GRU and his handler want him to take it. And he turns it down a trip to Japan. What they did, they took many of the scientists over to Japan after the bombs were dropped to see, you know, to see the destruction and stuff. And he was on that list, but he turned it down. Now, why did he turn down a job? The witch hunt, in a sense, was starting, looking for the red scare or whatever. And about this time, uh, one of the guys up in Canadian 
gave himself up and walked in and started blowing names. And Coble's name was not in anybody else's portfolio, but Coble was a smart man, obviously. And he figured he was on borrowed time that somebody would find out. Uh, because when he joined the army and all that, he did use some false information that his parents were dead, that he was raised in a children's home in Cleveland. And if eventually somebody starts looking and they find out his parents are alive and actually in Russia, then they're going to grab him. So he goes back to New York and once again goes to school. The one historian said that was his, his uh, badge of courage or his, his cover. Any time that he didn't know what was going to happen, he went to college or <laughs> he went to school. Uh, but he goes back, he returns to New York, and anti-communism now is starting to make it into the papers. Uh, it's 46 uh, people are accusing people of being red spies here in the country. We haven't got to McCarthy yet, but you know what that was all about in the world now. He had no direct line to spies being caught. The only direct line he'll have is to Lassen. And Lassen's smart enough, and you're going to see here in a second, Lassen's smart enough to get out of here too. There's Cole's girlfriend. Janet Fisher was his girlfriend here in Dayton. The only person that maybe didn't like Cole, supposedly, was her mother. That's not Janet. That's a girl nobody knows the name of. I'll explain that in a minute. But he would go to Sunday dinner at Janet Fisher's house, and her mother, as mothers will do, start asking him questions about your mother and your father, and he'd always change the subject. He didn't talk about it. And she was a little leery of him because he wouldn't talk about his family. That was the only part you want to say negative about him than anybody said. In New York, Jean Finkelstein was his girlfriend. He met her at a bowling alley. Her brother ran the bowling alley. And she had, he had this card to give to her, and she gave this to the FBI. I think they might have figured out who this girl was, but she never, there was no, no name in any history and it didn't play any part. Okay, you start seeing more defections going around, that the people giving up, admitting that they were spies, or they were Russian sympathizers, whatever. And Soviet defections and detections occurred in 45 and 46, and potentially inching closer to Kobol. Again, nobody had his name, but, you know, more and more things are uh, coming into him. This guy was the one in Canada. He has that over his head because he's testifying to anybody seeing. But he was a uh, uh, radio operator or a clerk, whatever he wanted. All, everything kind of came through him. And finally, he walks into the office one day and says, I want to give up. And he tells everybody about spies that he had and such like that. This is the guy that had uh, Lawson's job before Lawson took it over, Jacob Golis. He died in 43. He had a mistress, Elizabeth Bentley. There is a book on her, a biography on her, called The Red Queen, Red Spy Queen. And she gives herself up then eventually. And, she, well, she don't die, she dies finally, but in 63, a very unhappy woman. These other spies that give themselves up have sold their stories for money. Newspapers, magazines. She wants to sell her story and nobody wants to give her a dime. And she can't understand why these other spies are getting paid and she isn't. And that was what she took to her grave. If anybody tried to interview her, she'd go off on them about, why are they paying him? I did this and that. So, anyway. At CCNY, Cobo applies. He's back in New York. He applies for the U.S. GI Bill to return to CCNY to complete his degree in electrical engineer. 48, he will graduate cum laude, ranked second out of 66 graduates. So now he's got two degrees, if you think about it. He's got this, he's got chemistry back in, uh, in Russia. One of the things he did there, and this is what they always wanted the spies to do, he created a, a sorority and a cap anew, if anybody <laughs> Never say anything about sororities, but he, uh, him and another guy created that. And here's the rules of a spy. Never socialize with cell members. Never meet at a handler's home. 
always make contact in public places, and never talk politics or praise your country. That would probably get you in trouble there a little bit, I would imagine. Now it's time for him to go home. He goes to this Atlas Trading Corporation, and they're in this building, fall autumn of 1948, and he gets, he gets a passport from them. Now this is interesting on this part, March 15, 48. The Department of State issues passport to George Cole to do business abroad in Europe for Atlas Trading Company. They're a company out of South America. Their owner is from Russia, but he lives in Chile. He tells the manager to write up, they said they're hiring Cole as a salesman, which they had no salesman, and he is to travel on commission for six months in Europe. They had no commission, and they did no business in Europe. They only did business in South America. But anyway, this is the, what they use. This is the passport that he uses to get out of the country. Now, when he gets out, and, and going back to the girl, a week or a few days before he left, they had what you would call an expo on atomic energy on Long Island. It was in the papers, everybody. And he takes that gene and himself, and he goes, and Kobo goes out there with the hopes of seeing some of the people that he worked with at Oak Ridge, or even in Dayton. And he doesn't see anybody. One man who knew him but didn't know him personally happened to see him there, and he would tell the FBI later, he really seemed kind of disorientated there, or dis. It really what upset him, he didn't see anybody, he wanted to see some friends. She said he was very quiet on the way home, took her straight home. Kind of hurt her feelings. So she ignored him for a few days, he never called her. Finally, towards the end of the week, she calls, I guess they had a central phone at his apartment house, because the landlady answers it. And she says, I'm going to speak to George. She said, George moved. I said, what? She said, he moved like Wednesday, and yesterday two big men came and took a big trunk out of his apartment, and he's gone. She calls her brother at the bowling alley, and he's, no, I haven't seen him. When she was doing all this, they claimed he was about halfway across the Atlantic at that time. He will go to France, take a train from France up and get back into Russia, is what he will do. Now. When he goes back to Russia, though, what he runs into is anti-Semitism is spreading its head. Stalin supposedly had started rumors that the Jewish doctors and Jewish people were poisoning everybody. And as one historian says, after he spread that rumor, then he started to believe it. So he's believing his own lie. And so he even supposedly executed a couple doctors. Uh, Jewish doctor, supposedly. Anyway, Stalin's really upset. They're not moving fast enough on building this atom bomb. And he puts this man, if any of you would ever have time, don't do this on a uh, full stomach, you'll get sick. Right. Google him and read about this guy. This is probably one of the most evil, if you really want to dig into it, human beings that ever walked. Stalin put him in charge of getting the atom bomb or atomic bomb built. Uh, his big thing was uh, sending his car out and picking up teenage girls, taking them back to his house, raping them, and then killing them. Khrushchev, when he becomes in par, Khrushchev will execute him. And when they tore his house down and dug up, they found tons of bones buried underneath this house. This was an evil man. But one guy says, he, he was always kissing Stalin's you know what. Stalin supposedly is just about dead, laying there in a coma, and he's standing there spinning on the floor calling Stalin names. Stalin wakes up, not that he hurt him, but he comes out of the coma. This guy falls to these names, oh, thank God, they start, oh, you're the greatest, all that. And then Stalin goes back into a coma, and then he starts calling Stalin names. 
So he was, what you would call two things. He was, I guess you would say, part of the secret police is basically what his job was. But Stalin told him, get this atom bomb bill. The politics of the atom bomb, when Kovo comes back to Russia, the GRU wants a written report of everything that he has seen and done over here that would be related. He writes a 130-page book to it. Maria, though, as nasty as he is, does not want to throw in the sinus under the, bud, under the bus or whatever you want to say. Only for the fact if he lost one of them, he has no value to put in in place of it. So, he sets up a deal where Coble sits in one room. Eight scientists sit in another room. They don't see him. They ask questions. He answers them and sends it back. Everything's written down on paper, back and forth. And I'll tell you right this. Coble was never outed while he was alive. Okay? I'm not saying some people didn't know who because of the GRU and all that. Anyway, Soviet scientists never knew the person. Deadlines were not being met, and who was at fault? They were all pointing fingers at one another. There is the father of, uh, that's our, that'd be their Oppenheimer, I guess you would have to say. Uh, Kurt, Kirchhoff is how she, I guess you pronounce that. And he was the one running. Now, Goebbels went back, done with everything the GRU is asking. Can't get a job. Why? He's Jewish, one thing. Two, on his resume, he is a private in the army, and he's never saw duty. No, just private in the army. That's not going to get you anything. The GRU has told him not, not to tell anybody. So he writes them a letter. I need a job. I've done everything you've asked. Can you give me a job and the education? He wanted to be a teacher is what he wanted to be. GRU sends a letter to the head man of the Department of Education. Says, hire him. Hire this man. If you have a problem, we will have an agent come talk to you. So he got hired as an assistant lab helper, we'll put it that way. He will go on to be a professor for 35 years at Bendelin in the chemistry. So he will come out of it okay on that part of it. Now, back here in the United States, J. Edgar Hoover <laughs> is getting excited about all the spies and the Russians. The Soviets detonate their bomb 1949. Our scientists, our military, and even Harry Truman, all of them said, the Soviets won't have an atom bomb to 1955 or later. Of course they have it. Right away, several of the politicians say, oh, that was an earthquake. It wasn't a bomb. That was a storm. That was an earthquake. Finally, Truman will go on the air and says, no, it was an atom bomb. They always said that the Russians were very good in theoretical, but not good in technical. And that was why they thought they wouldn't get it so long. Now, Hoover is on the witch hunt now. He, he's looking for everybody. And this will probably be the beginning of what McCarthy will come along in, in very shortly. Then you've heard of these people, House on American Activities. Yeah. This is theirs. The main thing, and they upset Hoover on this in a way, they started looking like at anybody, but then they all start settling on the Hollywood people. Instead of settling on maybe some, what's some real spies, they're all out trying to get, you know, the entertainers who had been either communist or supported communists. He writes an article in Reader's Digest. They're able to match Faraday to Lassie. And they come across Cole's name finally. Not at first. The only reason they came across it, they looked at Raven Electric's employee list and then happened to look down through like Los Alamos and Oak Ridge and they see Colville's name. And they wait a minute, wait a minute. He worked here at Raven, now he's at Oak Ridge. That made him suspicious. In the meantime, Lazard's gone. Bingo, he's out. The last anybody sees of him, he sends a postcard from Paris. He's on the 
I think it was the West Bank of Paris. His son had graduated from MIT. His son had joined him. And the postcard showed a picture of her last and his wife and, and uh, uh, the, the kid. And that was the end of it. So that was all of it. And they never did nothing. Like I said, not anybody knows what. But when they come across Cole's name, of course, Hoover immediately thinks, well, this guy might be a spy. Uh, now, we got exposed, but before we get to that, when he thinks he might have a spy, they're trying to find out where Cole is. And they finally find out that he is in Russia. So Hoover has the bright idea, we'll extradite him. <laughs> He's an American citizen, we'll extradite him. They send a letter to the uh, embassy, the embassy writes a letter to Colville, asked him to come in for an interview. He never goes in. Two months go by, he sends a letter back and says, I am a citizen of the, United, of the Soviet Union, and the story, I'm not coming in. So Hoover's all upset, furious. He alerts all his offices and all worldwide connections to his office. If you ever see a picture of this guy, he crosses over, grab him. Well, he ain't going to leave Russia. And that pretty much ends us ever looking for him or even knowing any more about him. Now, he teaches for 35 years. His wife and him were married 65 years, and she will die. And they exposed. This is how we finally start finding out some more about him. In 1999, a thin stoop by a speckled 85-year-old George Cole enters the American Embassy. His immediate family has passed away by this time. His older brother's dead, the father, the mother, his wife. It was just him. His oldest brother did have some kids. He's got some, nep she, some nephews. You'll see a picture of his niece. George had been told about special benefits for the U.S. Army veterans. <laughs> now, he was here as an army in our army. So, there's the uh, embassy in Moscow. His trip over to the embassy, the GRU you know, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? It causes some anxiety. They knew some of what was going on, but they don't know the complete story. And when the letter from the U.S. Social Security arrives, the GRU are afraid to discredit the intelligence structure. So they make a smart decision. <laughs> they raise his pension. They started a monthly food delivery to his home. They added him to their advisory committee for intelligent veterans. Now realize he's just a, a private, you know, and they got him on the, on the board. Uh, they hire a man, the GRU, called Lotta, Lotta Loda, L-O-T-A, his real name. Why they can't all use their name, I don't know. He's a historian, and he was told to research the work of Delmar, which is cool. And for an August magazine article, he would tell readers Delmar was alive, 85 years old, but would not reveal his name. So there's the first part of it. February 2000, Social Security tells Colville he does not qualify for <laughs> retirement benefits. I'm sure he wasn't going to come over here and try to get him if he could. But the GR not knowing what's in the letter, though. They honor Cole with another award pin only for GRU officers. There's a private getting a pin at the officers. So they keep trying to keep him happy. The GR authorizes a book about George Abramovich Cole. The title, GRU and the Atomic Bomb. Now, this loader will go interview him and he says it took me forever to try to get him to open up. Because he didn't trust it, you know. They was told not to say anything. And he first meeting was only 15 minutes, and then he got a little longer, and then he tells the story. This book has never been uh, made into uh, English. Now, some of these people that have wrote, if they undoubtedly got their hands and probably deciphered, you know, some of the some of the words in it. But there is nothing from Russia like this that's ever been printed over here. Using only the Delmar Cole name and false identity, he called him Dimitri in the book. He wouldn't call him George Cole. Cole was never outed why he was alive. Arnold Kramish, who worked with him down at uh, Oak Ridge, finds out about Cole over there, calls him on the phone, 
And for a little while back and forth, they will send emails and talk, mostly about their Oak Ridge experiences. And Kramer says, I'd love to write a book about you, George, but I know you can't tell me, you know, anything. And George didn't tell me. So and Kramer dies in 2010. Party in 2003, celebrating Goebbels' 90th birthday, he was asked by two of his students to sign Lotus' book, GRU and the Tonic Bomb. His signature on two books, Zora Abramovich, George Abramovich, and he puts in parentheses, Delmar. He outed himself to a sense. And that was the first that somebody really knew. In late January, he dies. Members of his family are decided. He will be cremated, buried next to his wife and her mother. In autumn 2006, the GRU built, well, right before that, built a new museum, like what we got here, Tom. And Putin didn't want to go. Actually, it says he didn't, but he said, okay, I'll go. In the door, he goes, and, you know, here we go. As he's just leaving, he sees a picture of Kobo on the wall. He says, who's that? They tell him the whole story. November 2nd, 2000, Putin will bestow George Russia's highest civilian honor, Russian Federation gold medal. Now, a couple of people in my class when I showed them this says, well, Putin was doing that to stick it to us. I have no doubt that's probably true, but he still did this and became public. Our intelligence people over here had a red face. I mean, they were very embarrassed and tried to make some excuses as well. Yeah, we knew, but we didn't. Yeah, da, 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 you know, there's just a picture of it, him having the drink and all that. And he finally, after 2007, he would close his identity and articles. They called him Delmar. And there's the last picture of him. That's his niece. That's just what I hear before he died. He was the only Soviet agent who legally gained access to U.S. nuclear projects. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. I hope that wasn't too long. If there's any Thank questions, we got scientists here and all that to answer for you. Yes. Thank you, Terry. Somebody wants to ask? I think you over, kind of overwhelmed them, but it's a lot of story. Yes. And an individual who survived all of that, not only in the United States, but in the Soviet Union for all that time, yeah. is a remarkable individual. The, the one article they did write about, well, see what, uh, I didn't put it on here. Hoover, after he couldn't get him, had a thing inserted in his file that he was a non-important client, that this guy didn't mean anything. And what the historians will say, well, wait a minute, if he'd been non-important when he went back to Russia, they'd shot him when he got off the train, most likely. Instead of doing all this and catering to him and then getting him a job, he had to be important. Let's put it that way. So whatever Hoover, Hoover's manipulation was didn't mean a thing. Let's put it that way. So. Anybody else? Anybody have a question? Any the only thing is, even though we had something to do with the polymer, or what do you call it? Polonium. 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 The reality is, how did he necessarily be, uh, hurt the uh, defense work for the United States? Well, he told he kept, well, he, he didn't hurt us. He, he hurt us by Russia being able to have the bomb much sooner. Okay. Okay? And... They didn't, even their scientists, did not know polonium. That's the difference. Yeah. They realized that the plutonium bomb was, e I, I don't want to use the word easier, but it, it's cheaper and you don't need as much room and so on. To build an uranium bomb, you have to have a huge area and all that. The difficulty with the uranium bomb is it's only the 235 isotope will have fission. That's less than 1% of all the uranium. And so, to, to separate it out, they built this huge facility that the K-25 he showed. Tremendous. They put it in Oak Ridge because they had the TVA, the power that it took. Yeah. It was using something like half the power or a third the power of the United States to separate that uranium oh to get one bomb. They needed it with the uranium. So plutonium, you you got by irradiating uh, uranium-238 to make the plutonium 
and then you chemically separated it, it was a much easier, less expensive way to make atomic weapons. And the second bomb was plutonium? It was plutonium. The, and the thing was, the plutonium bomb had an issue that it would fit, it could fizzle if you didn't have enough neutrons. And that's mm -hmm. where polonium came in. Polonium decayed fast and, and, and when it hit beryllium, made a burst of neutrons. Really less than 50. But they came in that billionth of a second when they would do the compression mm -hmm. to fire, fire, to get the, the, get the chain reaction to propagate. And it worked. It worked on Trinity and it worked on Nagasaki. And so that was that information. I mean, uh, Kovo wasn't given design, but he saw what was being done, and presumably, very friendly guy, you know, you, people aren't supposed to talk, but, you know, you saw the sign, don't show, don't talk, you know, but he was a nice guy, and, and, and helpful, yeah. and very, and apparently it worked, I mean, enough that they didn't have to invent everything and discover what the, United States people would discuss. The spies out at Los Alamos were probably showing uh, mainly the structure of the bomb and, you know, some of the things that, the steps they were going through. But here, it happened here in Dayton was the, should we say, the, the, the crowning point to put the, it that Dayton way. Dayton and, and at Oak Ridge, because that's where they were preparing the material, what it took to, to go that pathway. And you know, we'll, we'll probably never know in our lifetime how much he gave the information, right. yeah. but it did work. And so it was a unique story and, and virtually unspoken of for over 50 years. As, as, as Terry said, Hoover played it down because Hoover didn't want to lose anything. But again, no one really knew about it until that was happened. So. Now, the, the other thing they end up learning, knowing was a little bit about Lassen because he was a hander and some of his spies probably talked finally. You know, he had a whole mess of them. But you got to give him Lassen credit. He knew when time to load up and go and they got out something like in 1950s when he left or something of that nature and uh, all that. Yes? The thing, the thing I think that people may not be recognizing is the purpose of the polonium was to produce a burst of neutrons which would then allow the uranium or the plutonium to go boom, okay? The concept of polonium is what Kogol gave the Russians. And then the Russians, physicists and everybody else, started recognizing the properties of polonium, and that's how they were able to produce a bomb that much quicker. I get you. Yeah. you you got to realize any of these countries with scientists into that position, they're not dumb. I mean, yeah. you know, you give them, give them something like that, they figure it out. So uh, that was the other thing you had to figure that uh, what he was sending there, even though it was new to them, they were able to, you know, yeah. come by and figure it you out. Know, you know, Terry, it's interesting that he was born in this country. Yes. And he, he uh, was a spy for Russia. Yes. He believed in the system. I, I didn't put that on any of the sites, but what, when he was asked, even by that, uh, his friend that contacted him there before he died, he believed in the system, and to him, the system was all of us having a chance. Not somebody, you know, with more money being able to do certain and go on to school. His mother was a socialist from the get go. That's 1910. His mother was a socialist. Never said too much about the father. I'm sure he was like a lot of husbands. If the wife was that way, he went along with it to make a happy home, probably. But, uh, he believed, and that's how he put it, I believed in the system. Now, he never said anything, but a little bit they had, he never said anything nasty about it. He does tell uh, the guy something, he said, I survived Stalin. But he kind of said that humorously, I, you know, I survived Stalin. But uh, you got to, yeah, he was born here and all that. I'm sure we got people here that are liberal. <laughs> you can you know, grow up here and all that, that, that you could almost call socialist, but... Uh, I'm sure we do the same thing with them. Yeah. And we don't hear about that. No. All we, right, well, thank you, Terry. Very, I appreciate it and everything like that. If there's any other questions or anything, you know, let Bob know, and if we need to do this for another group or something, be sure. here. Yeah, if somebody else interested, Terry would be happy. Thanks again.